good day. Our today's discussion is just a continuation of our last week's, and it will center around the second and third generation gods, which are the Titans and the Twelve Olympians. Our objectives for this day's lesson are, first, to describe the origin of the myths to understand people's origin, desires, fears, instincts, and needs, and second is to examine the great philosophical questions on how the world and mankind came into being. So this is still a part of Hesiod's The Eugoni, and first we will tackle about the second generation gods, which are the Twelve Titans, and here are some details about them. So first, they are the children of the primordial deities, which are Uranus, or Father Heaven or Sky, and Gaia, Mother Earth. The word Titan seemed to mean strainer, because they strained and performed some presumptuous, fearful deed and the vengeance would come after it. The home of the Titans was called Othrys. Again, before getting into the lesson, I want to remind you to be mindful of the colors that I use for each god, because each color represents what type of god are they. For red, it represents gods that are just personification of different concepts. For green, it represents earth gods. For black, it represents gods or creatures that live in the underworld. For brown, it represents monsters. For light blue, it represents sky gods. For dark blue, it represents sea gods. And lastly, for violet, it represents mortals and demigods. So here are the names of the 12 titans. First, we have two earth gods, which are Gaia and Cronus. And then we have two sea gods, Oceanus and Thethys. And then five sky gods which are Theia, Hyperion, Creus, Coius, and Phoebe. And lastly, we have three titans, which are only a personification of different concepts, and they are Themis, Iapetus, and Nemesis. First, let's have the two sea gods, which are also a couple, Oceanus and Thetis. Oceanus is the god of the ocean, and Thetis is the goddess of river. Oceanus and Thetis are the parents of the 3,000 oceanid nymphs, which includes Electra, Calypso, and Styx. So Electra is famous because she is the sea cloud goddess. Calypso is a sea nymph that was banished by Zeus in the island of Ogygia for supporting the titans in their battle. And also in the Odyssey, she plays a vital role in making Odysseus' hardships much even harder by imprisoning him in her island for seven years. So lastly, we have Styx. So she's the eldest out of all the 3,000 ocean nids, but unlike her sisters, she lives in the underworld. She is probably the most famous river to exist in Greek mythology because several stories involving her has been written. Like for example, there is a story that if you dip yourself in the river Styx, you would have the ability to be invincible just like Achilles. And also, if the gods swear by the water of Styx, their most binding oath and if the gods break this oath, they would be rendered insensible for a year and then banished from the divine society for nine years. And Oceanus and Thetis are also the parents of all the rivers and fountains in the world. Next one are the sky gods, Theia and Hyperion. And like Oceanus and Thetis, they are also a couple. So Theia is the goddess of sight and ether, and Hyperion is the god of light. Theia and Hyperion, together, birthed several sky gods, and they are Helios, the sun, Selene, the moon, and Eos, or the dawn. So Eos 
married Asrius, or the dust, and together they had several children, the Anemoa, or the four winds, Zephyros, Boreas, Notos, and Eurus, the Astra Planeta, or the planets, and Aesphorus, the morning star. Then we have another sky god named Creus. So he is the god of the heavenly constellations. The sky god Creus married the sea goddess Eurybia, and they had two children, Astraeus, the god of dust, and Pallas, the god of war. Next, we have the sky gods Phoebe and Coeus. Phoebe is a moon goddess, and Coeus is the celestial axis. Phoebe and Coeus married, and together they had two children, Leto, a goddess, and Asteria, the goddess of falling stars. Next one, we have Iapetus, a personification of a concept, and he is the god of mortality. Iapetus bore three gods with his wife Asia or Clymene, and they are Atlas, the god who carried the sky, Prometheus, forethought or the god of fire, and Epimetheus, afterthought or the god of hindsight which is also Pandora's husband. Pandora is the first woman. Then we have Nemesin, the goddess of memory. So Nemesin became one of Zeus's wife, and together they birthed the nine muses. Cleo for history, Euterpe for music, Thalia for comedy, Melpomene for tragedy, Terpescore for dance, Erato for lyric poetry, and Polyhymia for choral poetry, Urania for astronomy, and Calliope for heroic poetry. Our next titan is Themis, and she's the goddess of law and order. And since she represents law and order, you would usually see her statue in front of court houses. So Themis also became one of Zeus's wife, and together they bore the Hore, or the Hours, goddesses controlling orderly life, which are Eunomia for order, Daiki for justice, Erin for peace, and Taiki for prosperity. And then next we have the More, or the Fates, which are white robes personifications of destiny. We have Clotho the Spinner, Lachesis the Allotter, Atropos the Unturned. Our last pair of Titans are Rhea and Cronus, and they are both Earth gods. Rhea is the goddess of fertility, and Cronus is the god of harvest. They are also the queen and king of the second generation gods. Rhea and Cronus are the parents of the third and last generation of gods, and they are the Olympians. So, they birthed six Olympians in total, but not all the six are included to the category of the 12 Olympians, and later we will discuss about it. So the Olympians consist of Zeus, the god of lightning, Poseidon, the god of sea, Hades, the god of the underworld, Hera, the goddess of women, Hestia, the goddess of the hearth, and Demeter, the goddess of the harvest. On why the reign of the Titans ended, it can all be blamed to their ruler, Cronus. So on our last discussion, we talked about how Cronus bravely stood against his father Uranus and promised Gaia that he would free his siblings, the Cyclopes and the Hecatonchires. But Cronus did not stay through to his word, for like Uranus, he was also frightened by his monster siblings. And to this, Gaia was angered. And since Gaia can also prophesize the future, she liked informing her son Cronus that one day, one of his own son would overpower him.
and take the throne from him just like what he did with his father Uranus. Upon knowing this fact, Cronus thought to himself that he would fool the fates, so whenever Rhea gives birth, he would eat the baby, even without knowing whether it was a girl or a boy. Cronus did this heinous act for five times. Each time Cronus would embrace the child lovingly, Rhea thought he would finally accept it, but of course, she was wrong. There came a point where Rhea couldn't take Cronus's behavior anymore, so she decided to seek help to Cronus's mother, Gaia. Gaia told her to trick Cronus, and she told her the following. When your time to give birth arrives, Gaia counseled her daughter, go to the island of Crete and take refuge in the deep, hidden cave high on the slopes of Mount Dicte. I shall see that the nymphs nurse your infant son with goat's milk, and I will have them hang his cradle from a tree so that Cronus will not be able to find him on land or sea or in the air. Young boys, the curetes, will march beneath his cradle, clanging their spears against their bronze shields to smother the sounds of his cries. And as for how to trick Cronus, Gaia concluded, he is so crazed with fear that an ordinary rock should be all you need to fool him. And so, Rhea followed this instruction. Several years had passed after this, and one day, when Cronus was thirsty, Rhea gave him a tasty drink. He was delighted and asked for more. Then a young stranger walked in and handed him the cup, and Cronus had swallowed the drink before it occurred to him that he had never seen the young man before. Who is he? he wondered. Why should he have brought me the drink? What if he has poisoned me? Why does my stomach feel so strange? Did I drink too much? Was the second drink different from the first drink? Suddenly, Cronus felt an excruciating pain in his stomach. He vomited up the rock, followed by Poseidon, Hades, Hera, Demeter, and Hestia, all of whom were fully grown by now. Rhea then entered the room, with a young stranger, Zeus, by her side. Your destiny is upon you, Cronus, she explained. The fates prophesied that a son would overpower you just as you overpowered your own father. That son, Zeus, now stands before you. You were ripping the fruits of the seeds you sowed when you swallowed our children and kept your brothers in chains in Tartarus. We will now see whether Zeus will rule with more intelligence and kindness than you did. Your mind has been as blind and your heart as hard as that rock you swallowed. If this stranger, son of mine or not, thinks that he is going to take my kingdom from me, he is not as intelligent as you seem to think he is, Cronus responded. Anyone who wants to rule in my place will have to fight me, and all of the other titans do. A few days after this, the battle of the titans and the Olympians began. The war lasted for ten years without victory on both sides. But Gaia once again gave Zeus a helping hand. She told him about her prophecy that if Zeus took the Hecatonchires and the Cyclopes up from Tartarus as their allies, the Olympians would win the war. Zeus obeyed this. They freed the monster children of Gaia from Tartarus and made them side with their group, which they obeyed. The monsters even gave the Olympians, Zeus, Poseidon, and Hades, powerful gifts which will be useful for the war. They gave Zeus the thunder and the lightning, Poseidon the trident, and Hades the invisibility cloak. The Olympians and the monsters were a great force, so they won the war against the titans in no time. The Hecatonchires hurled the titans beneath the earth into Tartarus and held them in chains in that dark, tessellate land for eternity. The two of them volunteered to guard the titans. The son of that titan, Iapetus, Atlas, 
was forced to lift the sky across his shoulders because of his height and strength. So this is how the reign of the Titans ended, and the Olympians replaced them to rule over the world. The Olympians are the last generation of gods who ruled the world, and there are 12 main Olympians in total. But not all of them are Cronus's children. Only four of them are. The remaining eight are only Zeus's children. And later on, we'll discuss why the other two children of Cronus and Rhea did not fit into the category of the 12 Olympians. The first god belonging to the 12 Olympians is, of course, Zeus. So as you can see, there is an open and closed parenthesis here that says Jupiter. So that's just his Roman counterpart. His name for the Greeks is Zeus, and for the Romans, his name is Jupiter. So Zeus is the king of the gods. He is the god of thunder, lightning, and the sky. And he is the youngest and the most powerful child of Rhea and Cronus. He, he is also known to fall in love with one woman after another. His representations include the thunderbolt, lion, oak tree, scepter, and the scales. Now let's discuss about all of Zeus's affair with both goddesses and mortal women. First one is Metis. So Metis is an ocean mead, and together they bore the goddess of wisdom, Pallas Athena. His second wife was the titan Themis, and they bore several children like the Hore or the Ars, goddesses controlling orderly life, Eunomia for order, Daiki for justice, Irene for peace, and Taiki for prosperity, and the More or the Fates, which are the white robed personifications of destiny. We have Clotho the Spinner, Lachesis the Allotter, and Atropos be unturned. Zeus's third wife is another ocean mead named Uranome, and she bore the three charities or graces called Aglaea for beauty, Euphrosin for mirth, and Thalia good cheer. Zeus's fourth wife is his sibling Demeter. And they had an only child named Persephone, who is the goddess of the spring. His fifth wife is Nemesine, and they bore the nine muses. Cleo for history, Euterpe music, Thalia comedy, Melphamine tragedy, Terpiscore dance, Erato lyric poetry, Polyhymnia for choral poetry, Urania for astronomy, and Calliope for heroic poetry. His sixth wife is Leto, and they had twins, which is Artemis and Apollo. Artemis is the goddess of the moon, hunt, childbirth, and fertility, and Apollo is the god of the sun, music, poetry, and oracles. Next up in Zeus's affair is Hera, his official wife. They bore five children, and they are Hebe, the cup bearer of the gods, Ares, the god of war, Enyo, the goddess of war, Hephaestus, the lame blacksmith and craftsman of the gods, who is also the god of fire, and then we have Eletia, the goddess of childbirth and midwifery. So out of these five children, the two of them are included in the 12 Olympians. Next are the wives of Zeus who are a mortal. First one, we have Semele. And they had a son named Dionysus, who is also a part of the 12 Olympians. Next is Danae, who is the mother of the famous hero Perseus, who beheaded the Gorgon Medusa. And then we have Leda, and they bore four children, Helen, Clemenestra, and the twins Castor and Pollux. So these set of children will play a vital role in the Trojan War, so please remember their names. Next is Alcmene or Alcmin, who gave birth to the strongest Greek hero, Hercules or Heracles. And then we have Europa, and they had three sons named Minos, Redamantus, and Sarpedon. And when the three of them died, they became the three judges of the underworld. 
aside from this, Zeus also had an affair with Ayo, and they had a daughter and a son named Caroessa and Epaphos. Our next Olympian is Poseidon, or Neptune for the Romance. So he is next to Zeus in power. He is the god of the sea, earthquakes, and horses, and he is also called as the Earth Shaker. His representations include the horse, lion, dolphin, and the trident. So here are Poseidon's affairs. First is Poseidon and Amphitrite, and together they had a son named Triton, who is the messenger of the sea. And then we have Poseidon with his mortal lovers. First is Euronome, and they had a son named Bellerophon, who killed the Chimera and rode the Pegasus. So Bellerophon would play a vital role in the story of the quest of the Golden Fleece. And then next is Poseidon and Ayetra. They had a son named Theseus, who killed the Minotaur and is also the founder of Athens. Next one, if Poseidon mates with a force of nature, the result would be Cyclops. Next up, we have Hera, or Juno for the Romance. So she is the queen of the gods, and she is also the goddess of marriage and family, and she is known to punish many women Zeus fell in love with. Her representations include the peacock, the pomegranate, crown, cuckoo, lion, and cow. So in many Greek stories, Hera is known to punish the women Zeus fell in love with, and they always end up in an unfortunate state because of it. Like, for example, the mother of the twins Apollo and Artemis, which is Leto. When Hera found out that Zeus had an affair with Leto and is actually having children with her, she cursed Leto not to find a solid ground on earth to give birth to her children. And that is how the island of Delos emerged, which was believed to be a floating island. Leto gave birth to Artemis and Apollo there, and since then, Delos became the sacred place of the god Apollo. Another example is Ayo. Zeus was forced to turn Ayo into a white heifer so that Hera won't find her. But Hera still found out about it and asked Zeus to give the heifer to her and sent Argus Panoptes to watch her. Zeus thereupon sent Hermes, who lulled Argus to sleep and killed him. Hera then sent a gadfly to torment Ayo, who therefore wandered all over the earth, crossed the Ionian Sea, swam the strait that was thereafter known as the Bosporus, or meaning Oxford, and at last reached Egypt where she was restored to her original form by Zeus and gave birth to their children. So the only woman that escaped Hera's wrath is Europa. Next, we have Demeter or Ceres. So she is the goddess of harvest and is also called as the great goddess or mother goddess like Gaia and Rhea. Her daughter Persephone is wed to Hades and her representations include the poppy wheat, torch, cornucopia, and the pig. Now we have Ares, or Mars, for the romance. So he is the god of war, violence, and bloodshed. He is one of the sons of Zeus and Hera, and he is despised by all except for Aphrodite, for he is her lover. So his children are Deimos and Phobos, or panic and fear. His representations include the Boar, serpent, dog, vulture, spear, and shield. Next one we have Hephaestus or Vulcan. So he is the god of blacksmith, fire, and forge. He is the son of Zeus and Hera and he is actually Aphrodite's husband. But they are just 
in an arranged marriage. And Aphrodite is very unloyal to him. So he is also the ugliest of all the gods. His representations include the fire, anvil, axe, donkey, hammer, tongs, and quail. Next up, we have Athena, or Minerva for the Romans. So she is the goddess of wisdom, strategic warfare, defense, and handy arts. She is the daughter of Zeus and Metis, and she sprung from Zeus's head. So an oracle of Gaia then prophesied that Metis's first child would be a girl, which is Athena, and that her second child would be a boy that would overthrow Zeus, similarly to what had happened to his father and grandfather. So Zeus took this warning to heart, and when he next saw Metis, he initially flattered her and put her at her ease. Then with Metis's guards down, Zeus opened his large mouth and swallowed her and her unborn child alive. This was the end of Metis, but also the beginning of Zeus's wisdom. After a time, Zeus developed an unbearable headache, which made him scream out of pain so loudly it could be heard throughout the earth. The other gods came to see what the problem was. Hermes realized that what needed to be done and directed Hephaestus to take a wedge and split open Zeus's skull. Out of the skull sprang Athena, the unborn child of Metis, fully grown and in a full set of armor. Due to the way of her birth, she became the goddess of intelligence and wisdom. And Athena is also one of the three virgin goddesses. They are the goddesses who took an oath to be a virgin forever and Zeus blessed this said oath. Athena is also Zeus's favorite child. So her representations include the owl and the olive tree. Our next Olympian is Hermes or Mercury for the Romance. He is the messenger of the gods and is the son of Zeus and Maya. He is also the god of thieves, commerce, travelers, medicine men, and anyone who used the roads. So Mercury drug is actually named after him since he is the god of medicine men. He is also the husband of Dryope, the daughter of Pan, who is the lord of the wild. His representations include the Caduceus, the tortoise, and the winged sandals and cap. Next, we have Aphrodite or Venus. So she is the goddess of love and beauty and probably the most famous Olympian aside from Zeus. So her origin is quite confusing because like what I've discussed in our previous meeting, according to the poet Hesiod, she came from Uranus's blood. But for some accounts, she is the daughter of Zeus. Uh, so we're just gonna adopt those two versions. And she is the most beautiful goddess. Her representations include the dove, bird, apple, bee, swan, myrtle, and the rose. Now let's have Dionysus, or Bacchus, for the Romance. So he is the god of wine, merriment, theater, and ritual madness. He is the son of Zeus with the mortal Semele, and he is the only Olympian born of a mortal mother. So basically Dionysus is a demigod, but he was just eventually turned to be a main god, to be an Olympian. So he is a favorite of Olympians and mortals because of his very amiable and fun character so that's why he's a favorite so his representations include the thyrsus the grapevine ivy red chalice and goat next we have apollo or phoebus for the romance phoebus meaning bright so he is the god of the sun, medicine, archery, music, poetry, and prophecy. He is the son of Zeus and Leto and is the twin of Artemis. He is best known for his oracles and healing abilities, similar with his father in chasing his lovers. So like his father, he's pretty similar to him, 
But unlike Zeus, Apollo is quite unfortunate about chasing his lovers. Like, for example, the nymph Daphne, whom he fell madly in love with at first sight. But she doesn't want anything to do with him, so she ran away from him and wished to her father to get him away from Apollo. Her father granted her wish and he turns her into a laurel tree. And another lover of Apollo was Hyacinthus, who was killed because of a disgust. So Apollo's representations include the sun, the lyre, bow and arrow, raven, dolphin, wolf, swan, and the mouse. Our last in the 12 Olympians is Artemis or Diana. So she is the goddess of hunt, childbirth, archery, virginity, and the moon. So she is the daughter of Zeus and Leto and Apollo's twin. She is one of the three virgin goddess, and her representations include the moon, hound, deer, she-bear, cypress tree, and the bow and arrow, just like Apollo. And now, let's discuss the remaining child of Rhea and Cronus who doesn't belong to the 12 Olympians. First one we have Hestia or Vesta. So she is a goddess of hearth and is one of the three virgin goddesses including Artemis and Athena. So she is known as the kindest and most generous of all the gods and goddesses. Her representations include the hearth and its fire. Originally, Hestia was an Olympian. She belongs to the category of the 12 Olympians. But since they have included Dionysus, she decided to step out because they cannot make a 13th major god for it is believed that 13 is an unlucky number. So in order to prevent a potential war between his sisters and brothers, she decided to just step out. Last one, we have Hades or Pluto for the romance. So he is the god of the underworld, the dead, and well, and he is Persephone's husband. Again, Persephone is the only child of Demeter and Zeus, but Hades actually just kidnapped her. She was picking flowers on Mount Etna on Sicily when Hades appeared from out of the ground and she was carried off by him down to the underworld to make her his wife. Some accounts also have said that Zeus actually aided Hades to abduct his own daughter, Persephone. And Demeter, Persephone's mother, heard her daughter's screams as she was carried off by Hades, but she was unable to find her no matter where she looked. Demeter effectively went on strike, abstaining from her role as earth goddess and disguising herself as an old woman at the court of King Seleus at Eleusis. As a result, the earth became sterile and no crops would grow. When Zeus saw what Persephone's abduction had caused, he decided that Hades should return Persephone. However, it was too late by this point, as Persephone had eaten the pomegranate seed and this meant that she had to remain with Hades in the underworld. To eat the fruit of one's captor in Greek custom was to agree to remain with them for all eternity. Until this point, Persephone uh, was fasting, but when she gave in and ate the pomegranate seeds, her fate was sealed. But Demeter was adamant. She wanted her daughter back with her. So Zeus hit upon a compromise. Persephone would spend half the year with Hades down in the underworld and half the year in the land of the living with her mother Demeter. Specifically, Persephone would spend, would spend the winter with Hades and the summer with Demeter. This would be repeated every single year, thus explaining the origins of the seasons of the year. So, Hades mostly resides in the underworld, and this is the reason why he isn't included 
in the category of the 12 Olympians because he doesn't reside in Olympus, the home of the Olympians. For most of the time, he resides down in the underworld and doesn't come up to Earth nor Olympus. This could also explain why there are not much stories written about Hades. His representations include the serpent, keys, chariot, owl, and the cypress. That is all for our discussion for today. Thank you for listening.